It's September 13th, 2021. This is Rook. She is an award-winning Iranian-American author, poet, academic, and journalist who has published several books and articles in Persian and English and has spent much of her adult life marinating on the question of what it means to be immigrants and the relationship between us and our adopted countries. In particular, Roya Hakakian has focused on her experience of being a Jewish-Iranian woman finding herself as a first-generation immigrant in the USA. Her latest book is called A Beginner's Guide to America, for the immigrant and the curious, and Roya Hakakian joins us for a feature interview today. Plus, we have your letters of the week. This is stories from, to, and about the Iranian diaspora. I'm Gian Gomeshi. This is Rook. Hi there, welcome to episode 144 of Rook. Nice to be talking to you. Hope you're keeping well wherever you are tuning in from around the world. Hello to you from Toronto, Canada. Salam, Dustan Aziz, Durud Bashama, Roya Hakakian coming up. Um, I really appreciate her writing, her perspective, her uh, revelations about who and what we are as immigrants and, and I- Iranian immigrants in mm-hmm. particular. Uh, she has a knack for um, making sense of the the confusion that we can feel as dual citizens, you know, uh, and, uh, or even more than dual. Uh, she's written a, a really interesting book that uh, she just released called A Beginner's Guide to America. Hmm, that's different. Yeah, and it's, you know, there's a lot. I, I mean, it's really interesting because she's kind of writing from the perspective of really appreciating America for what it is mm-hmm. as an American, mm-hmm. but also appreciating, um, you know, her background as an immigrant, uh, as an Iranian, as a Jewish mm-hmm. Iranian. Um, and uh, it's so some people have called it a love letter to America. And, mm-hmm. and uh, but it's also kind of a. Um, a solidarity bridge to to other immigrants. Uh, it's very. She, I mean, she's. If you if you've been following, you know, if you've anywhere from the New York Times to uh, various publications, various um, media broadcasting places, Roya Hakakian has been a, a. I think a really important voice in the last twenty years. And um, I'm very happy to have her on the show. Talk about Lulz. Mm, I can't wait to hear this interview. I'm ashamed to say that I, I, I'm not familiar with her work, mm. um, but I definitely mm. will have to look by the books. Have we um, had a guest on that you have been familiar with? <laughs> yeah. Before? Yeah, like yeah. two, maybe. <laughs> I'm kidding. Tara Tiba. No. Tara Tiba, of you course, like I love. Hello, the fabulous Keon. Hi, Gian. Uh, hi, Groovy Shia. Hi. Uh, Hi, Azizan. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> really so, Aziza. Kurt. So yeah. How dare you not call him Azizan? Hi, Captain Reza. <laughs> Hello, sir. It's the original team here. The OG team. <laughs> Are you know we what I mean? expecting someone? Well, to- <laughs> I just mean there's no savvy Rohan. Oh, or I know. Paris. Yeah. So nobody's, you know, mixing things in here. It's, it's the original, you know, <laughs> no loose pozzi. Yeah. With, uh, Nobody's adding Zereshk to you know, Gaymeh. There you go. Thank you very much, uh, Reza, for putting it in terms that almost no one understands. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I love the Reskin game by what? the way. What? What's wrong with Is you? Is that a real thing even? Yeah, I, I love up. it. Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah. That's not real game, yeah. That's not that's not Yes, game, yeah. but I love it. Uh, we should explain for those who are no. It's in in Nazris they they um, put the Reskin game and I love it. Do you in know Naz- where? Nazri like charity food. They oh. put the resk on top of game uh-huh. and it's Why do they do that in charity food? Uh, Zeresh being raisins. No, Zeresh. Sorry, is being a. <laughs> 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 it's not Zeresh. <laughs> Are you guys sure Zeresh? you're Persian? All of you. <laughs> it's uh, mulberry, uh, I think. Uh, 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 it's like a. Um, what do you call it? The, the bar- little. Barber. 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 
I I don't know honestly. Uh-huh. Yeah. But you did know that they do it for charity. They yes. It's very selective the things you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm random. Yeah. 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 Super Sometimes random. Sometimes you know things but you don't know the reasons for them. <laughs> Yes, he's like a true philosopher. <laughs> or you get it wrong, and then we get letters about it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, it's funny because it's true. What Shia says things, and all of us kind of like, like we oh. nod and go, "Oh, he must know." You right. know? And then you find out, like a week later, <laughs> no <laughs> one, no one agrees. Like no one, I mean, you have we, you can't find oh, one yeah. person. Like even my mother, um, Shia is very nice, but I don't know if he knows about <laughs> Zedesh. <Z-Eshkin thing." laughs> like she'll be, you know. No, if you remember, actually, we've had this discussion with Chef Haas. Oh, mm-hmm. yeah. Okay. And I told him that Zeresh can game, and oh. he said, yeah, actually, in some places, they use Zeresh okay. can game. Yeah. You have to listen he to He was Roach probably being there. nice. He was being nice. I don't remember that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're coming to you on rookmedia.com. It, it is there. You can link to all of our platforms. We're on an ongoing mission to build a new audiovisual encyclopedia of Iranian diaspora identity on Spotify, SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, uh, cast box if you'd like to see some visuals with rook switch over to our social media networks youtube or instagram right now if you like your rook descriptions and bulletins in english and farsi check us out on telegram uh the handle is usually uh, i think on all of our platforms it's at rook media That's right. and uh, of course once again our website rookmedia.com is where you can also become a patron and support us uh by pressing the support us button in the upper right hand corner uh, how was your weekend it was good. It's the last. What is it? The last, the second last weekend of summer. So uh, made the most of you've it. You've got it. You've has you, know, the, <laughs> you have the. You know the exactly where we are in the calendar. A few more weeks and it'll be unlivable. Outside. Another seven months of you <laughs> complaining. Yeah, yes. pretty much <laughs> <laughs> miserable <laughs> complaining about being here. You and know, living. I, I, uh, I had a nice weekend actually. I went yeah. to a uh, Iranian. There's an Iranian cafe in Richmond Hill, Ontario, Which called one? Miros. Mm-hmm. Miras Cafe, and they, they, it was a really, really nice place. I really in, enjoyed having a I bezaned a double espresso there, oh, and nice. uh, yeah, like a sit down coffee shop. It's proper. kind of a yeah. It's got oh. some it's got some seats. Actually, a really nice patio right mm-hmm. now. Uh, really nice folks, uh, Leila and Kavon, who run it. Uh, uh, Miras, it's, and Miras is M I R A A S. What does that mean? Well, it means, what does it mean, legendary or? or it's heritage. heritage. Heritage, yeah, it means heritage. Yeah. Legendary. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, <laughs> but raisins, it raisins. means raisins. <laughs> so, so uh, but I know Shia went on a little uh, trip this weekend. Oh. And yeah, now the reason, I, now I haven't asked him anything about it because we traded messages, you know? And so I, uh, cause, so I left him a message yesterday. I was like, uh, hey man, just check it in. I hope you're doing okay. You know, see, I, you know I'm like an older brother. Right? I'm, I got to see if Shy is okay. You're if, the older brother. Sometimes I, I wonder. <laughs> uh, like, you know, I got to make sure Shy. Well, no, he looks he like looks the like older a brother. But, yeah, he's like my, my grandfather. Yeah. yeah, no, but you know, I got to make sure he's all right. He's not in a sewer somewhere Aww. or something. You know. Sewer. So I, uh, so I say, hey. Uh, uh, how's it going there, uh, Shia? And then, and then he left me a message. It was like, <laughs> well, first of all, Shia. When I don't, have you ever gotten a message from Shia? I haven't yeah. had the pleasure. It, it's no. like it's coming from uh, you know. First, it feels like he's he's somewhere on the other side of the world in another era. Like it's so far away. It's like, <laughs> there's always like a crackly, you know, kind of weird, and he uh, like white noise, and you know, it's never it's never clear. And he goes. Uh, Hello, as is, um, uh, as um, <laughs> I have made it to Niagara. Wow. Yeah. You were not so, <laughs> I was there too. Well, hang on a second. So, okay. hang on, let me explain this. So. Well, that's great. I, I know you were there okay. too, but you were in a fucking, yeah, yeah, with a yeah, McLaren <laughs> and a, you know. I know what, wherever, she, whatever Shy was doing, he Ooh. wouldn't have seen you because you're in some penthouse <laughs> something or other. I, you know, uh, I, Shy was probably at the bus station. <laughs> so, okay. So, like, let me explain this to people who, now, I, I know nothing other than, I, I have made it to, to Niagara, right? <laughs> So I. Uh, <laughs> so, so the greatest thing is, I mean, let me explain to anybody who hasn't, you know, didn't grow up in in the vicinity of where we've grown up. Niagara Falls is kind of, uh, you know, it's the obligatory Southern Ontario, Canada, Upper New York State, America tourist attraction known for these amazing natural wonders of these uh, waterfalls and for cheesy hotels and mm-hmm. heart shaped jacuzzis, right? <laughs> yeah. 
So, and it's kind of like a rite of passage. Like, you know, inevitably, as we were growing up here, if mm-hmm. the Persian relatives vis- visited or somebody, the first thing, we are going to Niagara Falls. <laughs> Dad, we always go to, we are going to, you know, <laughs> yeah. Skyline Tower. Yeah. You know, like Persians that. love it too. Yeah. They now, love what is it? Why do Persians love it? I don't love, know. It's something my father my loved dad, it. I know. Yeah, yeah. Obsessed. He was, I mean, it was always the first thing. Like, yeah. we are going to Niagara Falls. You know? <laughs> and uh, we always did the same thing, the same walk, yeah. and we had to go up the tower. Right. And, you know so anyway so but the greatest thing about Sh- so Shia I guess you went to Niagara Falls right yes. that's what you were talking about but the greatest thing was with the crackly line and with the way Shia <laughs> it was like he discovered Niagara Falls <laughs> like like Shia is like an explorer you know with the stick he walks with you know like, oh, I have made it to Niagara you know it's like it exists oh, no, you say Niagara what, what is that like it's like you know Shia the discover the explorer right? so Shia what, what was this trip to Niagara Falls yeah, and and by the way, you've been here for a couple of years in Canada, yes, but you've never been. Huh? That's oh. true. Yeah, because of that, actually, I was excited. So it was good. Uh, generally, I'm not a fan of like touristy yeah. sites and things like that. But but it is a brown people thing. Like I mean, you can't you can't. <laughs> yeah. so I have to ask. Maybe I'll ask Roya yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. but I mean, like, why people don't waste their time with? No, let's go to Niagara Falls. A lot you know? of immigrants love it's it. All, it's all it's all it's all immigrants. <laughs> it's like we are going thing? to Niagara Falls. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Well, why do we? What well, you know? And then baby in chicka, you know, you know, so. something to do with tabiat. Like we lo- Persians love like nature and w- wonders, wonders of, and yeah, yeah, yeah. and so. hotels yeah. and <laughs> like yeah. overpriced cheesy <laughs> restaurants, <laughs> sweets, and yeah. yeah. Okay, sorry, Shia. Yes, no so please, yes. So uh, I love it actually. It satisfied my expectations. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think I won't go there uh, <laughs> <laughs> ever again. What? No, you it, it's it. enough for what, what, one did, what is it that you did at uh, Niagara Falls? You went and you uh, were you with friends or? Yes, uh, I went there. You didn't I, go by yourself. No, no, no. With no. a stick. <laughs> so I was hoping you had walked there or something like no. Gandhi when you made the. You know. Okay, so you went and. So uh, I, yeah. no, I went there and like I walk um, and to the Niagara Falls and I yeah. saw it and this is it <laughs> <laughs> I came back and you came I did back. nothing special actually. Uh, it really cool. is I mean it's it's it's, it's all good. inspiring right mm. it, it, for at least the first three minutes like you're just like <laughs> oh my god this is fucking look at yeah. this look at this how did yeah. this and yeah. and it never stops the water and then yes. after about four minutes you're like hmm you guys hungry <laughs> you guys want to go for a yeah. you know some pasta yeah. it, it's worth the trip if you want to go and gamble a little bit because there's oh, a casino that's right. there. Well, now there's a casino. Yeah, yeah, this yeah. yeah. So, because I, I went there like two weeks ago, actually. Of, of my course, he. So Reza, right? He's His a version of Niagara Falls is the gambling. Man, <laughs> that's a casino. Yeah. He doesn't even see the pool, the, of the water. <laughs> no, he's never I seen actually it. didn't. We didn't even go to Niagara Falls. <laughs> <laughs> I just went to the casino when we went and ate and oh uh, God. made the gas money back <laughs> and <then laughs> came back. That's oh, you won at the casino? Yeah, I did. I did. Wow. I won. I won. Not a lot, but. So what did okay. Sh- Shia? You went and saw the the. Wa- how did it? It satisfied your expectations. There is two falls, you know. Yes. One, one is smaller. The one is. And you know what they? The, the, there's one is the American Falls and yes. one's the Canadian Falls. Yeah, the right? Canadian Falls. It's really huge. You know, yes, it's a horseshoe. <laughs> yes, mm, right. Yes, it's yes. called the Horseshoe Falls. Yes, yeah. yes. And uh, drilled into us as kids, you know. <laughs> I didn't know. And it was this is the <laughs> Canadian Falls. Like we were always very yeah. proud because our falls are bigger than. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah, what yeah. It's the only thing that Canadians have that's more impressive <laughs> that's than the Americans. It, yeah. you know? Who drilled that in your head? Because that sounded like the impression you made of your dad. This is the. Kill that, is, that is. It was my dad. Oh, it was yeah, your yeah, dad. It was my dad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We are going to Niagara Falls. Oh. Oh, Canadian yeah. side. <laughs> and but then it would probably be something like uh, somehow he would work it around to why I'm inadequate. Like it would be like a. Uh, the falls, they are great. You could do better. You know, it's, it's like, <laughs> like, You're not. Why you didn't get an A? You know, like, <laughs> How many times did you go there? Like a hundred times. Oh, really? Uh, I'm telling you, it was the family trip. Yes. Constantly, you know, it's like other families would go skiing or they would go, you know, to, to some cottage in the summer. Where we would go to Niagara Falls. So what, was when, when was yeah. the last time you went there? Uh... 
probably when I was going driving, just driving down to New York, I went through yeah. that. You drive uh-huh. past there, mm-hmm. but to visit Niagara Falls, to visit Niagara it's Falls. probably it's been a you while. Know, if you've uh, never yeah. been on, uh, n- never done Made of the Mist, have you done? Did oh you do yeah, that? that's worth the, the Made of the Mist. You know what that yeah. is, Shay? Yeah, yeah, the yeah, the yeah, yeah, You go on yeah, the you go on the boat and then you go close to the falls. Yeah, you wear the you know the the yellow raincoat, the iconic yellow raincoat. I would have liked to see Shy in that actually. <laughs> Shy with a stick. And, I mean, it's like, I kind of wish I did discover Niagara Falls. You know? <laughs> I have found, I made it to Niagara. First of all, who says I have made it to Niagara? You know, it's like, yeah, it's not like, hey, man, I'm at Niagara Falls. I have made it to Niagara. <laughs> like, so that, so, uh, you know, Shy, that's Shy's experience. He went and saw, probably had a hot dog or something. So, Keon. Now, how, like, here's what I want to know. How did you get to Niagara Falls? In what vehicle? <laughs> In this new McLaren convertible. <laughs> At the hefty price of, what is it, half a million dollars? Yeah. I mean, anyway. Yeah. Wait a minute. Did you have the top down from Toronto to Not Niagara Not the whole Falls? time. No, he wanted to say. have it down. I said, listen, man, oh I didn't do my hair for two hours just to ruin it. By the so. way, you really dressed up today. I, you know, once in a while, I'm not Is that I'm from Roya <laughs> Yeah, I thought I'd put on my green dress. No, but like you're super dressed. You got yeah, heels. I, you know what it is? You're used to me during COVID months, like where oh. it was like sweatpants, miserable, fat. Actually, that's not true. I've known you yeah. for a long time. And you that's are, right. you do are, once actually, you're, you're notoriously known for, like, I remember we, um, when the Raptors, so it was a basketball, oh. we were, a, a few of us were getting together to watch the Raptors when they were in the, had that historic yeah, season. Yeah, there, yeah, yeah. Just like three years ago or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and everybody was worried that Keon was going to turn up at the pub with like full on <laughs> ball gown and, you know. <laughs> and but you didn't, yeah. to be fair. No, you I came did not. In your gym clothes. I wore jeans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gym clothes, yeah. yeah. So anyway, I'm going back to pre-COVID Keon, you know. Oh, like okay. Back, nice. starting to get back in Elegant. shape. And uh, yeah, not horribly disgusting. And yeah, that's the look. Never, never, <laughs> Keon. You're never. I have made it to <laughs> Niagara. <laughs> but no, so I was, what, 20 minutes away from the falls? Uh, where they have beautiful vineyards in uh, Niagara. Yes, they do. Yeah. Niagara on the, you went to Niagara, Niagara on the on lake. Niagara on the lake, yeah. yeah. Have you that's been? where the rich people go. Yeah. <laughs> did you go wine tasting? Yeah. I did, yeah. Oh, it was lovely. Of course. <laughs> I brought my food, by the way. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Shy, <laughs> Shy packed a, packed oh a lunch. <laughs> Oh, you guys oh my god! We should. Have, it would be so good if we had a split screen. Oh, Shia so with the like, he's un, he's Literally unwrapping so some cellophane with like a, oh a sandwich from three days ago. <laughs> Keon, <laughs> Keon is eating a four thousand dollars steak. Yeah, yeah. You guys are breaking it. my heart. Uh, w- would you like more caviar? <laughs> mm, we'll take it in the McLaren. <laughs> Shy <laughs> drop. This is Shy drops his sandwich into the falls. Oh, oh he has nothing to eat. You know? okay. uh, <laughs> the contrast now I'm sad. is great. Oh. Uh, yeah, we went. Um, we went wine tasting. I mean, what do you guys do when you go to Niagara Falls? We fucking eat a sandwich. <laughs> That's what we do. Yeah. Have you gone wine tasting in Niagara on the Lake? I have gone. Okay, wine isn't it lovely? It's beautiful. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's like and you're near the Shaw Festival. You could have caught a play. Oh yeah, that's right. Mm-hmm. I forgot that that I didn't even know it was happening. Uh, it's hard. Post COVID, we forget about things right, like exactly. theater. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and speaking of um, prominent uh, Iranians like yourself who've done very well for themselves, did you see that Britney Spears? I would rarely talk about this on this program, but there is content that relates to the global diaspora. <laughs> yeah. Britney Spears got engaged, oh, right? Did, to, to a Persian, to a Persian Sorry, guy, yeah. right? And we, this guy. What's his name again? Sam? Uh, Sam Asghari. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's harder to book. We've because he we, his name That's came right. up before. We were like, yeah. oh, let's get him on the show. We can't get the guy on. We can't. No mm. one can get in touch with him because he's too busy with Britney Spears well, getting guess. engaged and buying. He's probably buying McLarens. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's like Keon's yeah, boyfriend. Yeah, She's buying the McLarens for him. <laughs> That's oh. right. Yeah. So, uh, so you know, I mean, for a certain type of. Iranian kid growing up, you know, to think that Britney Spears would mm. choose an Iranian, mm-hmm. you know, that's mm-hmm. validation of our it's people. Interesting, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> we've made it. And funny <laughs> enough, he's not a sec- he's not second generation uh, American. He's first generation mm. immigrant. Like that's his right. his, his, his like, This could be you, Reza. <laughs> <laughs> you could have ended up with he, that. They actually I met on a a, on the set of a music video. Like he was the like I guess the love interest of one of the music videos. So Was he a model or something? He's a model, uh, I right? guess, model he's actor. Very handsome or, guy. Yeah, he is yeah. a handsome guy. That could have been you, Reza. I got a better girlfriend. Aww. She puts oh, Britney Spears answer. to shame. Wow. There's no comparison. What are you talking Look at about? That. 
Mm. See, he has nice. a script in front of him. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, mi- I, I, miss, I messed up my line. <laughs> Let me do that again. <laughs> hey, Kavandi.ca. Remember that name. If you are looking for immigration help and resources, Kavandi.ca. Katy Kavandi Immigration Services. Instagram page, Immigration. This is a full-service immigration firm that offers all inland and overseas immigration services, including temporary visas, permanent visas, PR extensions, uh, citizenship applications. Kathy and her team are available to inform and assist you as their client throughout the whole immigration process. If you want to come to Canada, uh, you can go to Niagara Falls with Shia once you get here. Or uh, if you're here, and you need support, any kind of support. You need an immigration counselor. Kathy is your person. A big thank you again to Kathy Kavandi and Kathy Kavandi Immigration Services, Inc. for making this edition of Rook possible, kavandi.ca. And a shout out to myterms.ca. Keon, myterms.ca. Shout out to them. Yes. Anita and Arash Fazalipur. They're life partners and business partners, the founders of MyTerms.ca. This is a mortgage company in Ontario, Canada. They have a really good record with MyTerms.ca, focusing on the service aspect of the mortgage business. And they're very well reviewed online. They specialize in multi-million dollar transactions through institutional and private sources and represent a handful of wealthy private investors who focus on one to $10 million first or second mortgages. If you are a builder, developer, or a mortgage broker looking to team up with a great source, this company is what you need. Check them out online at myterms.ca or give them a call at 416-MY-TERMS, Arashan Anita. Fazadi poor. I know they give a they make it a big priority to give back to the Persian community as well, thanks to myterms.ca. All right, we um we're gonna get to our future guests, but we have letters today, right? Yeah, we do. Uh, from two different actually three few different things. Uh the Dr. Fatali Muradam episode, ah, which yes. was a, a lot of interesting letters from that one, as well as Tara Tiba. And also from uh from the Rook Funny that we posted, uh we had a lot of comments uh, yesterday we disagreeing posted with uh <laughs> So what's the problem? That, that, that Shia taught us the terms Doff yeah, and Puff. Yeah, and Puff, and, and people and are saying that uh Shia's it, was, wrong. it was incorrect. <laughs> Yeah. I don't know. We Googled it, though. I'm curious to see, to hear the letters. Uh, yeah. Uh, we will um, see you in just a bit. The fabulous Keon, Captain Reza, Groovy Shia. Stick around. Let's get to our feature guest. You know, if there's been a subtext to this program over the last year and a half, it has been perhaps around the following question. How are we to make sense of the complexities, contradictions, and confusion of the immigrant experience? And more specifically, How do we grapple with the question of identity for those of us of Iranian descent living outside of Iran? Well, my featured guest today has spent her career so far meditating on these very questions. She's an award-winning Iranian-American author, poet, activist, academic, and journalist who's published several books and articles in Persian and English. Roya Hakakian's opinion pieces, essays, and book reviews have appeared everywhere from the New York Times to the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, and NPR. She's also worked in broadcast journalism, including with 60 Minutes, and Roya is a founding member of the Iran Human Human Rights Documentation Center. She came to critical attention for her 2004 memoir, Journey from the Land of No. Then her next book, Assassins of the Turquoise Palace, was named a New York Times notable book in 2011, received the Asian American Literary Prize for Best Nonfiction Book in 2013, and made Newsweek's Top 10 Not to Be Missed books list. Roya is also the author of two collections of poetry in Persian, For the Sake of Water and A Name to Worship, and is listed among the leading new voices in Persian poetry in the Oxford Encyclopedia of the Modern Islamic World. This year, she's published a very well-received book entitled A Beginner's Guide to America for the Immigrant and the Curious and Right Now. Roya Hakakian joins me from Woodbridge, Connecticut today. Hello. Hi, and I'm delighted to be talking to you both, you know, as a podcaster, interviewer, and a compatriot. It doesn't happen often. (laughs) <laughs> I thank you so much. I, I've been um, looking forward to this. Your insights are always interesting. We're also aware of a similar vintage. So there's lots I relate to in your story. Ooh. So um, thank you so much for doing this. Pleasure. Listen, I want to get to your story of being a, a Jewish kid who grew up in Iran and what it meant to come mm-hmm. to America in 1985. But mm-hmm. first, you've said the precipitant 
for this latest book, A Beginner's Guide to America, was mm-hmm. 2016 and the rise in anti-immigrant sentiment around the time of the election of Donald Trump. You've talked about that moment, Roya, being a call to action of sorts for you. You know, and I was thinking, I was reflecting on you and your career and thinking, you've actually spent many years talking about the plight of immigrants and even what it's like to be a Jewish minority and Iranian through the Gulf War, through 9-11. What made 2016 the call to action? What didn't make 2016 a call to action? There are two moments that I experienced in America in all the years that I've been here that have really shaken me up. One was 9-11 in the year 2001, and the other one was 2016 when I was hearing all sorts of things I'd never heard before, like, you know, uh, let's not allow immigrants into this country. Uh, Let's only take the ones who speak excellent English or who speak English. Let's only take the rich ones uh, who come with wealth or let's not allow those from Iran into this country. Uh, you remember the Muslim ban or whatever the ban it was. Right. Um, and what was very <laughs> jarring to me was that even though by then I was long a naturalized citizen in the United States, every single one of those things felt like a threat to me. I could easily put myself in my 19-year-old shoes and panic at the thought that I didn't speak English when I came to America. I could have been kept out if I were coming in in 2016, or I came with just a backpack. I didn't have anything to my name. But it truly, truly felt like it was no one else's business but mine, that if I didn't speak, who would and who could? And and I did not want to argue with anybody. I didn't want to answer to anybody. All I set out to do was simply one thing. I thought if I could bring the readers up close and personal, to who I was when I was 19, when I first came to America, how it felt, how anxious I was, and how extraordinary it was to try to figure my way in this new setting, in this new country, under this new language, uh, in this new culture, then I don't have to do anything else. Mm. That if I could make that experience accessible to readers, then they would simply be uh, rejecting everything else they were hearing from everybody else, and my job would be done. So to be clear, even if the discourse is, you know, the Mexicans are coming build a wall, you feel that personally. You get that that could be you or us. I mean, I, I completely identify with that. At the same time, I think, I don't know if it's a product of our own uh, prejudices or the, the, the racism we migrate with or whatever it is, but, you know, there are a lot of Iranians who don't see things that way, who would kind of go, well, we're not Mexicans, we're not this or we're not, we're not that. As you say, that's none of my business. I'm sure you've come across that those attitudes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, first of all, my joke, which may be a bad one, is always that, you know, people tell me, oh, there are a lot of Iranians in Los Angeles. And I always say, that's why I'm in Connecticut. You know, <laughs> I, don't, I don't share a lot. How dare you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? uh, I don't have a lot in common in certain ways with certain groups uh, within my own Iranian community. That said, I, I should also say, in all fairness, that pretty much every immigrant community gets to America and wants to shut the door on everybody else who is behind. Hmm. This is not a, a, something new. Uh, it happens with uh, all sorts of immigrant communities. We all want to feel that it is our own private club that we have arrived in. Why do we that do that? Th- why, I mean, you'd think that we would have an empathy. Why, 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 why do immigrant groups do that? Why do we want to shut the door on others? It's it's an interesting thing, and I think you know we should ask a psychologist. But but I think uh, it's first and foremost a, a a survival instinct, right? Because we are uh, new, and we are afraid that if too many people come, 
uh, then what? You know, do we have to make room? Do we, th will it get crowded like it got crowded, you know, in Iran in 1979 and we had to leave? Um, we just feel like it's safer to to close everything off mm. and be in our own little unit, I think. But there may be other explanations for it. The good news is that it takes a generation or two uh, for that feeling to go away. And, and I also think that there is some naivete in the process of our dialogue about immigrants and immigration in America and perhaps where you are too, in that, you know, there is more immigrants than any one of us uh, as a country, as a single country, or even a single continent can absorb. That's because there are so many crises that are unfolding that we had not envisioned. Mm. And, and so part of what we need to do isn't simply uh, a, an immigration uh, problem that needs to be solved. Part of it needs to require needs and requires that we all come together as nations and try to figure out what we want to do with these forces that are uh, uprooting people from where they are so that's a different issue right, i think right, right, right. we can't possibly open our doors to all of them because there will be no end to to the number of people who will want to come in but at the same time i think it's a it's a continental mandate for all of us it's a it's a global mandate for all of us to try to make uh, these countries that people are driven out of inhabitable again for their residents. But in terms of that feeling that you had in 2016 and that call to action and uh, mm -hmm. the frustration or the identification with other immigrants that are being discriminated against, etc., you know, it raises an interesting um maybe a paradox uh, with with the release of this book of yours. I mean, the mm -hmm. nature of the book itself, you mm -hmm. know, has been described as patriotic. Uh, you know, there was a review, a very good one, that said this is a love letter to America. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, which and which it is, and because you're 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 uh, as the title uh, you know suggests, you're showing uh, uh, another kind of America, and, and you're doing it kind of proudly. At the same time, it raises interesting questions in and of itself, especially in the context of the growth of anti-immigrant attitudes recently. Like, it, so you're a patriotic American, you're also Iranian, and you're Jewish. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. How how do you square that love of America with the fact that many Americans may not want you in the country? Country or may not see you as American enough? That's, that's uh, a wonderful question, and I'm happy that you asked, because um, I've thought a great deal about this, and I continue to think a great deal about this. Um, so let me tell you what I've what why my first visceral reaction was in 2016, especially after something else was said, which was, Maybe we should revoke the naturalization of certain people who have already been given, uh, who have al already been naturalized. And I'm thinking, what? You know, they're going to go through, you know, people who've been naturalized and revoke. Um, so um, I truly, I had many reasons to take everything that was being said very personally. And my first visceral reaction was, oh, my God. If not here, where would I go again? And, you know, I had, I had left Iran in 1984. I had been a refugee in Europe for about a year. I had come here and hated it for several years. It took me a very long time to kind of make it home for myself. And the thought of, you know, this becoming a place where I had to leave once again from was just unimaginable to me. Mm. So uh, when I asked the question, where would I go now? The answer was nowhere. I'm going to stay here and fight. So my book is a love letter, but, but it's also a call to action. I am saying that there is the America that we see, but there's also the America whose blueprint has been handed down to us in the form of a, a wonderful constitution that that you know with all the amendments it already has and the ones that it can uh, it can have in the future and and 
certain legacy of of various struggles, including the one for civil rights in this country, right. that have shown us that we can actually come together, change things, and succeed. And I thought, between those two things, there is no reason not to love this country, because however bad it has been, or whatever there has been about it that needed correcting, it has the capacity to be corrected and to take correction. Mm. And, and I think that gave me the courage to say, I love this place. It may not be perfect in certain ways now, but, but we have reason to believe that it has enough raw material to allow us to make it better mm. wherever it needs to. And, and that's really what the book is. You know, I do have to say, I mean, I, I have to intervene here when you say, uh, you know, the question was, well, where would I go? There are a bunch of us on this side of the border in Canada raising our hands going, well, come, come to Canada. We're here, you know. Uh, but but, uh, but I also understand that, uh, I mean, by, by, by the way, Canada is not immune to our own issues around Sure. racial uh, you know uh, not to mention ancestral issues uh, of, of what the discrimination and uh, horrible things that have happened here but um, <laughs> yes I understand what you're saying about America one of the things I really love about the way you talk about America is the unveiling if you will of um, some of the beautiful there's a, there's, a, there's a chapter called diaspora in your in your latest book and you talk mm -hmm. about the beauty you see in America as an immigrant in ways that are not we see when we talk about countries especially as immigrants where we we land in these traditional tropes of it's a democracy it has laws it has a you know a <laughs> look at the size of the building you talk about for example the practice of being able to return garments to the store <laughs> <laughs> right after a few weeks yes. and you yes. were can, can you reflect on that because this was a revelation to me but but then when you explain it in the book it's it's so interesting well Talk about um, that a little bit. you know i have a friend who came from iran um she was brand new comer to the united states and two weeks after she had arrived i said let's go to the gap i have something to return and when she read this book which was 20 years after she had come uh, 20 years from the time that she and I first had that conversation. Uh, she said, the moment you said, I want to return this garment to the Gap, she said she was panicked. She thought we're going to get arrested. She thought that we were going to go to the Gap, raise hell, have a big fight, and they were going to call the cops and throw us out of the store if we were lucky or haul us away. And And... She says to this day, and I have to say that she's an interventional cardiologist, so she has learned a great deal uh, while she's been in this country, but she says that one of the greatest lessons that she ever learned was that day with me going to the Gap and actually returning the garment without any problems. Right. Um, because we, right. we just, you know, there are certain things, uh, those who have been born and raised here, can simply not see and and you know i've told people you can't return a garment in other countries and they say really uh, of course really because the individual doesn't have rights in in the same way that the individual has rights uh, in this country and and there are so many hidden uh, and small pleasures that we are handed as a result of um, having this infrastructure, having this society that are completely the how we need to understand democracy. But but how we need uh, how we understand democracy at the moment is simply the idea that every four years we can go vote right, for wh right, whomever right, we want. Right. But it's not that it's it's the fact that you and I understand that we have to abide by the green light when we are driving because uh, we both believe that these laws or these traffic regulations serve our society. Right. And in if you don't believe in the society or the current structure of it, you don't care about the laws. Is that exactly? Right, exactly. Right, 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 right. And so, and so people tell me that. You know, whenever they come back from Iran, and I'm sure you've heard this too, that 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 driving makes them 
crazy that th that you know so many foreigners so many americans so many foreigners who have traveled to iran say that they don't want to be in a car traveling in iran because it terrifies them why because we have green lights in iran we have red lights in iran nobody nobody observes the rules nobody abides by them why because it's a society where people don't believe uh, that the laws are there to serve them mm. Um, and therefore, you can have the very same regulations in another side of the planet, but, but the green won't do what the green does right, here, right, and right. nor does the red. And, and, and these are the things that I wanted those who, people who've been born and raised in this country to see, because they fail to see them. And that's why this democracy seems dispensable to them at times. But what I love about the Garmin anecdote as well is that uh, it's such an interesting one because it also suggests the difference among us as immigrants. I mean, intra-immigrant differences, you know, in the sense that, I mean, it may seem obvious, but we're not a monolith. So even though you and I have similarities in the challenges of being Iranian, growing up Iranian and say white communities or, you know, whether it be in, in the States or Canada or whatever. I, I was born and, and reared in the UK, so mm -hmm. it, it never occurred to me that returning something to a store was a novel idea. Mm -hmm. Can you reflect on the differences in our experience as immigrants? Yes. Um, so, you know, the, the moment um, I took my friend to the store to return that Gap sweater, she saw something about America. She understood something about America. And she understood at the same time something about Iran that no other book and no lecture could ever show her. And that was, you know, what she didn't have in Iran, which was the ability as a customer to assert herself, to claim um, her own rights, but also the fact that Everybody else in this country thought that this is what's done, that, uh, you know, every garment is returnable. So, so my job as an immigrant is to try to reveal um, what is hidden from the view of the native born because it's always been part of the decor. Mm. And, and it's all these little things. Uh, that returning a garment is not a natural thing that you can do, uh, uh, you know, wherever you come from. And only an immigrant can impart that knowledge onto, uh, you know, an American or a Canadian who's been born and raised here and assumes that these are not simply rights uh, that they have kind of grown out of, out of earth. Mm. Um, but these are rights. And, and these are gains that those people who came before us and struggled um, for equal rights, for consumer rights, for individual rights, have uh, put into laws that we now um, are living our lives by. But I guess it's the um, delta between the first and the second generation immigrant. The second generation immigrant knows they can return the garment. It's not. It's not an interesting thing to them. It's the first mm -hmm. generation immigrant that's like, "What? How does it? Is, is that? Would that be another way of explaining it in terms of the difference?" Yeah, absolutely, between, yeah. absolutely. And I think that's why, in some ways, uh, the f the first generation immigrant, my generation, not yours are the people who need to be injected in the, the UK, in the US, into Canada, so that we can remind them of the gifts that they have, uh, but cannot see. Right, right. I think immigration is essential, not because of jobs only, not because we need our, you know, we need to have nurses aides, or we need to have elder uh, caregivers, or we need uh, computer programmers, we need those. But we also need them because they are the people who see the wisdom of what we have and what we've built and that everybody else cannot. So we are the people who come and celebrate, even in silly ways, right? We are the people who wave the biggest flags. We are the people who, yeah, you know, yeah. uh, turn up the biggest smoke at July 4th. Um, <laughs> That's true, we yeah. are the people who yeah. can get excited um, about what's here. Yeah. Uh, and therefore, we are just as essential. Yeah, some of the uh, proudest Canadians I know are Iranians who came like three years ago. 
from you know yeah. it's from Iran and they're like mm-hmm. they've got the flag we are Canadian you know like it's yeah. you're absolutely right you've also talked about the idea that I mean in terms of the advantages of being an immigrant that the immigrant this is something you've said I don't know if I'm paraphrasing but the immigrant knows the formula to succeed in a way that the westerner doesn't necessarily know what, what does that mean well um there's something we bring with us that that gives us a, an essential narrative. And I think, and so many uh, people, you know, thinkers have said, that human beings need to shape um, their, their understanding of themselves and where they want to go in life around a particular narrative about who they are, where they come from, and where they want to go. So when we come to the West, um, you know, I come from Iran, you, uh, you know, uh, uh, and, and the rest of us come from these troubled places. We arrive here with a narrative, right? My narrative has been, I could have been dead because so many of my own classmates when I was a teenager in high school in Iran were taken away right. and I never saw them again. So I always think my survival w- is a mere accident. I, I shouldn't have lived because some of them probably didn't. Um, and who knows what happened to them. Um, so I know that by being able to leave Iran and come here, I've been granted a second life that in some ways I wasn't meant to have. And I think and I think so many other immigrants who uh, leave, you know, war-torn places or, uh, you know, other troubled areas arrive here and say, oh, my God, if I survive that, what right. is there right. that I cannot survive? And that gives us an advantage. Because the moment you believe that there is nothing that can take you down, there is nothing that can defeat you, you instantly have an edge. Right? right, and and you instantly feel that um, you're that much stronger than than everyone else. Um, you you simply uh, have proven to yourself that you're capable, and and you're able to survive. And and I think that's sort of the narrative that so many people um, who are in some of these communities in the United States, where businesses have left. And these communities have uh, kind of uh, become uh, forgotten by by the rest of the country. Um, And they have nothing to turn to, uh, no real employment, no path forward to change their lives. Um, They don't have the advantage that the immigrant has. They don't have that drive. They don't have the narrative. And I think they have less of a chance of making it uh, as compared to the immigrant, right, right. There's and it, and and it also plays into that empathy piece that people that knowing, being able to identify. We, we recently had uh, last month a, a a woman named Dr. Sheila Nazarian on the show, and she's a now she's a very glamorous sort of plastic surgeon in Beverly Hills with a Netflix mm-hmm. show. But you know, she literally escaped Iran as a Jewish kid with her family, you know, walking through Pakistan to get out, and so she mm-hmm. has a perspective on um you know when somebody comes to her clinic or something you know and and think thinks oh this this glamorous woman probably doesn't rest, you know understand me she has an empathy that is built in from that mm-hmm. that life story exactly what you're mm-hmm. talking about exactly you know, your life story is an interesting one you you grew up in a jewish family in tehran um, mm-hmm. as i understand it your your dad was a principal of a hebrew school in tehran and your mom was a hebrew teacher is that right that's right um that's right my my father ran one of the only um, Hebrew day schools in Tehran. So, uh, you know, Hebrew days are run in such a way that you have all your Persian language uh, lessons or secular lessons in the mornings. And then um, from 1 1 p.m. onward, uh, you study Hebrew and uh, the Old Testament and all the other things. And and so he was one of those principals. And, and it's funny because when he was alive and 
Um, he loved going to Los Angeles because he never had to pay for a meal when he showed up at a restaurant because <laughs> they remembered the, him. <laughs> yeah, people, yeah, you know, yeah. his students saw him and they recognized him and they treated him and wow. and he loved it, you know. And I thought it was sweet. What what I love about that what you've talked about in terms of your early years though as well is that um you know, there's this period in Iran that I'm quite fascinated by in the 60s and 70s that I that I wish I'd been able to experience there. That that is that is um, this moment, uh, you know, where it's eclectic and it's inclusive. And you've talked about this beautiful neighborhood. This is before the revolution, obviously. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. People like Homasar Shah and and uh, Jimmy Del Shad, who I know they're much older than you, but they've talked mm -hmm. about how you know being Jewish at that time in Iran in a place like Tehran or Shiraz it wasn't a big deal in fact it was it was celebrated you know that was it was they were, it was this kind of uh, mosaic uh, w w can you reflect on that what did it mean to be a Jewish kid in Tehran in the 1970s well I was very small so uh, you know I I I can't say that you know at the age of seven or eight or nine um, I was aware of, of so many of these uh, things that later on became major social issues. Sure. But I loved my neighborhood. In fact, the irony is, after all these years, I have yet to find a neighborhood like that. Um, mm. Because that's, that's what I loved. You know, we were, um, you know, there were uh, Baha'is next door. There were Zoroastrians across the street. There were Muslims uh, all through the block. And um, there were Armenians who were Christians um, on the same block. And and we played together all day long. You know, there were um, a network of homes with open doors to all of us. And no one ever knew um, in whose house we were hanging until it got really dark and one of our mothers started shouting in the middle of the street to to call us home. Hmm. Um, that was a beautiful experience and it really breaks my heart because um, first of all, you know, as, as Americans, we keep boasting of what a great culture we have right. because we celebrate being hyphenated. Well, we, we, we were hyphenated. Um, we were past hyphenated when I was a child in Tehran. We, you know, we, we simply were together and no one really uh, talked about uh, these taboo subjects that later on um, became an issue after the revolution. So um, it was really a, a, a golden era that we should all take great pride in and and strive to return to. Where was the neighborhood in Tehran? Do you remember? Yeah, of course. I've written about it. I, I drew maps of it for my publisher, and they, you know, um, put the maps in um, in the book. It was Crown Prince Square, which after the revolution was named the, the Valiast Square. Right. And, and um, it had a uh, movie theater, um, and it had a big fountain in the middle of this uh, square that I remember to be a, a most beautiful, you know, um, layout of flowers and, you know, cascading waters from a water fountain. And, or, you know, that's, that's what nostalgia does to you. Yes. You, <laughs> you remember things far more beautifully than they probably were. But I ask because I, 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 I knew where you, <laughs> you grew up and I, and I know that, and it's one of those places that fascinatingly and, and, and as you say, heartbreakingly gets rebranded post-revolution. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's, it's like a whole, I mean, all the street names changed in, in Tehran, but, yeah. the, but mm -hmm. the, the, the rebranding of that particular um, uh, area is, it, it's quite, it's quite sad. You can't go back there and expect to see the same thing. Right. Um, mm -hmm. When did you, Roya? When did you first realize, as a as a teenager, that the lives of ethnic and religious minorities in Iran were going to change post revolution? Do you remember, like, was it your dad came home and, as a kid, do you realize, uh oh, things are changing here? Well, um, I I describe some of that in my memoir, uh, Journey from the Land of No. Um, the perhaps the first moment was. In 1978, when there was a uh, slogan in in black print uh, that was 
uh, written in graffiti across uh, our home on, on the wall and that said, Jews get lost. Mm. And, and then next to it was, um, was a symbol I had never seen. So I read this, I run inside and I said, I take my dad to the courtyard, I open the door and I show him, uh, you know, I show uh, the graffiti on the wall and I, I say to my father, what is the sign? And he doesn't tell me what it is. He shuts the door. Uh, and, and at first he says hichi, nothing, hmm. and he shuts the door. And we go back inside and I say, so what is it? And he says, it's a swastika. And I had never seen a swastika. I didn't know what it was, um, which is in some ways now, it, you know, in a world where anti-Semitism is, um, is uh, on the rise yeah. again, uh, is remarkable, right? So yeah. I made it to the age of 12 and I had never seen a swastika. Um, I, I would say that's a I was going to say, now now a 12-year-old kid's probably seen it on the internet a thousand times. Exactly. Yeah, unfortunately, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So so my father tells me what it is and and I I am stunned because, uh, because these had been my father's memories and I had always thought Oh my poor father! He had such a difficult childhood in in this you know faraway place uh, in Khonsar, Iran, and that wasn't Tehran. But it was uh, I always saw that as only his, not mine. And suddenly, what had been his, um, and I thought something that belonged only to that area and that community um, had reared its ugly head. Um, 40 years later in my beloved neighborhood. Um, so that was probably among the first shocks. Right. And then, you know, other things came along, you know, that were equally uh, shocking. But I experienced them uh, somewhat differently because I was a little older and then I had a community of peers who were there to um, kind of see me through and support me. They're really, I mean, just thinking about being, you know, 12, 13 years old when you're, this is happening with you or even younger. Um, you know, w when you were describing that, that um, multi-ethnic, multi, -ethnic, multi uh, that diverse neighborhood and everybody playing with each other, it's like, it, it's the, the heartbreak of finding out that you're different all of a sudden. You know, all of a sudden it's like, oh, we're we're different. We're not allowed to be here. We're we're being we somebody spray painting something. The notion that the you know the kid is not born racist, right? Or the kid's not born mm -hmm. to see themselves as different from everybody else. It's mm -hmm. society that teaches us that, and 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 it's mm -hmm. it's so horrible to think of that. Well, I I have to say that I knew I was different because. Uh, you know, because on Fridays we we walked to the synagogue and and we had Muslim neighbors who um, were so close to us that would come over on on the Sabbath and right, turn right. the lights on and off right, for us. So right. so it was very clear that we were different. But but we weren't ashamed of the difference. We thought that the difference was very normal, very natural. Mm. That that everybody was different, and so what. Um, I think that's what's uh, changed, you know, in some ways. It isn't that we were blind to the difference. It was that we were fine right, uh, accepting right, the difference, right. seeing and in some ways being okay with the difference. You go as a political refugee with your mom. You're in Europe for a year. Then you arrive in New York in 1985. You said earlier in this interview, you said, I, I hated being here. I didn't want to be here at first. W where did you want to be? I wanted to be in Iran. I, I, I knew how bad it was, but I had two things that happened to me. First of all, <laughs> as, as terrible as the revolution was uh, and turned out to be, I thought it was fun. You know, I thought, <sighs> wow, you know, y people can actually take to the streets and, and you know, bring this euphoria. Um, to the nation and, and also change things. And so I had come to believe, having lived through that, that, you know, we can change it again and, right, and we right, should. Right. So I thought um, we have to stick it out, 
stay and do the same thing I had seen other people do one more time and, and do it right this time. So so that was one thing. And the second thing I'm was... I'm guessing that didn't go over so well with mom. Oh, <laughs> no. <laughs> right, that yeah. Was so, yeah. The other thing was that I had absolutely fallen in love with um, modern Persian literature. And I had been lucky enough to have come across a community of, you know, people slightly older than myself who thought that I had talent. And so I didn't want to part with that community. I didn't want to part with that language. And I was devastated to be here. Mm. You know, I love your meditations on on when it feels like one has, quote unquote, arrived. You, you've talked about the notion of arrival being not this instant event, but happening in increments. Um, can you reflect on that? Sure. And I love the fact that you call it meditation because it is something that I um, have never stopped thinking about because I don't think there's a bottom to it. Um, I don't see arrival as something that happens instantly. And, and I think one of the things that as immigrants we need to impart on non-immigrants around us is that Arrival is not something that happens. And after that, you can have all these expectations from the immigrant who has, in your imagination, arrived and therefore must behave <laughs> in, in certain ways. You know, I, I remember people used to say to me, for instance, when I had first come, um, where are you from? And I would say where I was from. And then they would instantly say to me, you must be delighted to be here. And nothing pissed me off more than hearing that. We, and the irony is that eventually I was delighted to be here, but it took about 15 years to, to get delighted. And, you know, there was so much grief um, in those early days that I couldn't see what was in front of me. I mean, I think that I was visually troubled because I was walking through a fog of, you know, forget jet lag, uh, a fog of grief and, and disorientation, which, you know, incidentally, I, when I talk to a lot of friends who um, have come after me, uh, they describe the same thing. So I think it's very important for us to keep saying to, to the non-immigrants that you got to let the immigrant be that, you know, interviewing the immigrant to see whether the immigrant is grateful or delighted is useless um, because the immigrant is trying to uh, sort through how she or he is feeling, um, how this whole, you know, how this experience needs to be understood, analyzed, uh, how all of that needs to settle in and make sense of. And I think uh, to try to rush people to put to words things that they have yet to figure out on their own is simply wrong. And then, uh, you know, gives us the wrong impression of, you know, whether they feel loyalty or, or not. But um, when do we know? We have a. I mean, I guess the the traditional idea would be when we get our citizenship or a passport or something, and we go, "Yay, we've arrived!" But I, but I mean, when do we really know we've arrived fully, um, or do we ever? Um, you know, sometimes I move back and forth uh, between Persian and English, and I'm not aware, right? And and if I'm talking to uh, an American friend. And he or she says to me, what did you just say? And I realized that I just said something in Persian right, and I didn't right. realize. I think that's part of truly arriving, that you move back and forth between the two and you no longer know the difference because you're so comfortable in both those skins. You know, I wonder if the struggle is as well in not wanting to feel or be an outsider. It certainly was for me as a kid uh, coming to Canada from England and then b and being Iranian and having a funny name and big nose and all of that. I, I, I love the story you've recounted. If I have this correctly, you were studying under Ginsburg, Allen Ginsberg in Brooklyn. Yes. He at some point, who 
you know, is a, I mean, as a writer would have been a dream gig for you to, to be studying <laughs> under him. And, and he at some point returns some work you've done, some writing, uh, some, he's marked it and, and actually gives you a, a, a less than stellar mark because he says what you've written is cliche and you actually revel in that. You get excited because it, su- <laughs> it suggests you're writing like an American. I, I, I love that story because it says so much. Uh, talk to us about that. Yes, you know, um, first of all, you know, I knew he was teaching at uh, the university where I was studying. And um, when I was a new immigrant, I didn't dare go to him because I thought, you know, it's it's over. I can never write again because this is a new language. And how dare I want to um, write in a second language? It wasn't for me. So I basically thought... Um, and I was a pre-med. I thought I was going to go to medical mm-hmm. school because, you know, I couldn't have a literary career. Right. Um, but then about, you know, four years after I'd come, um, I was fluent enough. And one of my essays as a um, sophomore was uh, being passed around by professors as a, you know, the most stellar essay that other students could uh, you know, try to emulate. And, and that kind of gave me courage to think that, oh, maybe there's hope. And so by the end of my fourth year, um, I just tiptoed my way to Allen Ginsberg's office. And, and I said um, to him that I really wanted to be in his class. And, and he said, but you have to have um, written uh, 30 plus poems. And by then I had already published my first book of poems. So I handed it to him. And, uh, <laughs> and of course, it was all Persian. <laughs> all right. So he looked at it and he said, "Groovy." And then he <laughs> said, um, "You're welcome to my to come to my class." And so he did accept me. And then, you know, the first time around that I turned in homework, um, he marked it all up. It was all red. Um, and and he was very disappointed because he, uh, you know, from from the few interactions that we had had, he. He somehow thought that I was um, I was better than that, and you know, but but exactly as you say, I was delighted to see the red marks, and I was delighted to hear that he thought he was disappointed in me because I had written cliches, <laughs> because I was trying to sound uh, or to be indistinguishable from yeah. Americans. Yeah. I was trying to uh, you know. Uh, so to speak, pass. I was trying to be, uh, you know, blend in. And when he said that I had written cliche, I was, I was ecstatic, and he was pissed off. And, and you know, and it was, it was very difficult to try to explain to him. But you don't realize that, you know, I thought I could never write uh, in this language. And not only I've written, but I've written uh, fluently enough that that you're saying I sound like everybody else, and which is what I wanted. Do do we ever become insiders? I mean, in terms of that idea of the, you know, the people behind the velvet rope, the white people who have, you know, who've been here for for generations. And there's been times in my life where I've thought, I I really, I mean, they they see me as a, I'm an insider. I'm a Canadian, you know. And then something will happen. Somebody will say something. Somebody will write something online. Whatever it is, that I'll I'll be reminded. Oh, okay, you still see me as the other. Uh, do do we ever become <laughs> insiders? You know, I <clears throat> I gave up on that dream in Iran. So I have never aspired to be, from that age onward, uh, an insider. Because I, I realized that uh, I had too many things against me. I was a woman in a misogynist country. I was a Jew in a, you know, a Muslim-dominated country. And then, you know, wherever else I went thereafter... Um, I was still a minority. So, you know, at first I was uh, despairing, but then at one point I said, to hell with it. You know, who says it's better to uh, not be an outsider? And and I turned that into somewhat of a, my own understanding of a special privilege. I thought, you know, this, this turns into uh, my listening post, my uh, lighthouse, right? The, this place where... Um, is distant from everybody where everybody else is, but gives me an advantage to uh, look into and and see everyone else and and then be a writer because I think 
I, I define myself as a writer, as that very person with that particular perspective. Yes. But that said, I am not sure there are insiders. I'm not sure uh, anybody is on the inside, really, because to be on the inside is also to also be on the outside at the same time, because, you know, who knows what's in and how long can we trust that that inside will forever be exactly the inside, right? Because, you know, social preferences change, um, you know, fashions and uh, trends change, and suddenly uh, you may have thought that uh, you were part <laughs> of the inside group, and suddenly, you know, with, with a few changes, you are on the outside. <laughs> and I think that's how some of the, you know, white Americans may be feeling that way right now. I, I once asked uh, the noted uh, idiosyncratic German filmmaker Werner Herzog, you know, how, how does it feel to always be, um, you know, uh, not in the mainstream? And he said, no, 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 I am the mainstream. It's all the other filmmakers that are on the outside, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I quite love that. Uh, you've also talked about the paradox of skilled immigrants, and and this maybe dovetails with the idea of of being an outsider. That you've written that that the idea that when you came to America, you had you had nothing, you were nothing, quote unquote, um, and that the acceptance into the country meant so much more because if you had come as this you know, vaunted, skilled immigrant that we hear so much about, you would have felt the relationship in America was more transactional. Tell, tell us about that. Precisely. And, and probably if um, anyone were to ask me, what is the one single most important takeaway from your book for non-immigrants? I would say it's precisely that. Um, I look at myself and how I came. I was a very bright um, human being, um, but I was also a product in some ways of post-revolutionary Iran. I had been in high school, I had listened to Death to America chants every single day of my you know, years in high school. And um, no matter how bright I was, a certain amount of it had seeped into me and, and was part of me. So when I when I arrived, I had arrived with those apprehensions about America and about being in America. Certainly, uh, on the night that I was leaving Iran, one of my friends came to the house and brought me a book called The Devil of the Yellow City. It was a book about New York by Maxim Gorky, and Yellow City was New York. And um, and it was to, and I think she was trying to tell me that this is where I was going to, to this city of the um, devil. And, and so that's how I came. You know, there, it, I had that negative perspective. And on top of my negative perspective, I didn't speak English. I came with nothing. And, and the idea that contrary to how I came and who I was, um, the, the gates of this country were opened onto me mm. and I was allowed entry. It was a magnificent thing to think through, you know, 20 some years later. And I think if there was one thing that turned me into however a patriot I am today, it's that memory. It's the notion that who else would have wanted me at that time, mm. at a time when even I didn't think I was worth anything. And, and who would be generous enough or, or imaginative enough to think that something better could come out of that, that human being that had arrived at that moment? Um, I couldn't see it. But somehow to think that whomever it was that gave me a visa to get in saw that or hoped for that and let me in is is quite magical. And I think if anything turned me into the sort of patriotic American that I am today, it's it's that notion mm -hmm. that they took me in um, under those circumstances. And conversely, I think those who come with skills always have a chip on their shoulders because they think, of course they took me in because I was a surgeon because I had $10 million that I deposited right, in the right, bank. Right. 
and and therefore you know they don't feel uh, that the feelings that i have they don't feel that this country helped reveal me to me this country helped build me and and i think that's the mistake that you know so many pe- policy makers make by thinking that um, we should open our doors just to those privileged yes, uh, yes. classes Yes, it's such an amazing observation and perspective. Um, listen, I've so enjoyed talking to you. I, I'll, I'll ask you a couple more questions before I let you go. And, and I want to ask you about being outspoken about Iran today. Because mm-hmm. um, you, you wrote an essay in, in March called Unveiling Iran. Mm-hmm. Um, and I want to quote from it because um, this is something we struggle with on this program a lot is, you know, what – how much do we need to take responsibility, those of us in the diaspora, for what's happening in Iran today? How much can we take responsibility? And, and you know, uh, we certainly don't want to walk around moping, you know, 24-7 because you know, there's enough to be disheartened about. But you write, let me quote you, when I had first arrived in the U.S. in 1985, I thought that the longing one experienced in exile had to do with being displaced but no longer. Now I knew it had to do with being wronged and wishing to see that wrong, which drove me from my homeland, righted. So, Roya, is that to say that those of us who are Iranian will never actually be at peace with ourselves while our land of ancestry is, say, not a democracy? And if so, that is quite a burden for us to carry. It's a burden, but it's also a privilege. Look, you know, every life becomes that much more beautiful when it has meaning. And oftentimes, meaning is is something that stems from a, a grand project we have in life that we give ourselves to executing. And then the notion that we all can have this privilege of thinking that we can do something to bring justice, to make this country uh, that we know and that we come from a better place, not even for ourselves, but but for others who live there, uh, is a wonderful thing. What else is there to do? Go to the mall every weekend? And, you know, how many miles can we jog And before we're bored? And what else is there to do? But really? you would be forgiven if you said, look, I'm an American now. I'm working to make America a good place. That's where I live. That's where the predictable outcome of my uh, of my actions can, can be judged. Uh, I, I can't speak for Iran anymore I don't live there. I mean you know these the people say these things what what how do we respond to them then well but, but the truth is America doesn't need me um, as much as those places like Iran uh, or yeah. Syria or Libya or uh, Egypt or Tunisia all these other places need their immigrants to to uh, reflect back on them the truth is that um, of course I want America to uh, become better than it is. I I do uh, want to contribute, and I, and I try to at at every turn. But I'm also in a pool of so many other people who are far more successfully and effectively uh, doing the same thing for this country. Right. Um, what what makes my life more meaningful is that I feel that I am in a position to do something that is more needed. And that thing that is more needed, um, which is, you know, doing something about Iran, um, happens to also give my life meaning too. Mm. Um, And I truly believe that. I don't see it so much as a responsibility. I see it as, um, as something that motivates me. I see it as something that gives me a sense of, uh, vision and also provides me and the lives of people around me with a certain narrative because you can always say uh, easily as we were discussing who I am where I'm going and what I intend to do a final question to you um, and this is back to the, the so sort of where we started in terms of the understanding being immigrants I guess that the orthodox analysis today would be that in the 21st century, immigrants to the West 
mm-hmm. uh, places like Canada, even to to America, uh, need not assimilate and melt you know, you know, be part of some sort of melting pot in the mm-hmm. same way that they would have had to in the 20th century, that cultural and ethnic differences are are celebrated or even advantageous these days. What do you mm-hmm. think? Do you think we've gotten there? Um, if, if we have, then I regret it. Because if there is anything, one of my greatest takeaways from the Iranian revolution of 1979 was the beauty of a collective experience, social experience. Mm. Um, Yes, the revolution was terrible, and the consequences have been more damaging than anyone had ever anticipated. However, that moment that, you know, so many people can selflessly join together to come together over a single project was so beautiful. And if I could only divorce it from the consequence, it would probably rise to be the most beautiful experience of my life. Which is to say that societies need to celebrate individuality, recognize distinction. But if they cannot come together and and they cannot together interweave into each other in in a seamless way, then they lose a a marvelous experience that's called nationhood and that's called social movement. And and if we just get stuck in this identity politics and insist on simply being ourselves and and not the bigger thing, then, then we lose something that is so grand that I... Um, wouldn't want my own children to go, uh, you know, be in a society that can't give them that grand experience. It's been such an education, and it's been fun, and it's been so, um, so gratifying. Thank you so much for this today. My my great pleasure. I didn't know what to expect, and you've been wonderful. Bye bye. Bye bye. Roya Hakakian, an award-winning Iranian-American author, poet, activist, academic, and journalist. Her latest book is entitled A Beginner's Guide to America for the Immigrant and the Curious. Roya Hakakian joined us from Woodbridge, Connecticut today. Phone's back on for Groovy Shia, Captain Reza, and the fabulous Keon. How about that Roya Hakka Keon? That was incredibly insightful, educational. She unpacked a lot of things that, you know, that I, I'm aware of. I just never think of to that level. Like, um, a lot of things we take for granted here in the West, like being able to return clothes. My you know, favorite, you just my don't favorite part. think I of love that. that so much. Right. I love that Traffic story. Traffic lights I, I, and like, you know, laws in general. Yeah. Like I remember the last time I was in Iran, um, I don't know how it works with the cab system, but I believe some of them, you can share it with strangers or whatnot. I think that's the cheaper option or whatever my relative ordered, ordered at the time. <laughs> um, and a gentleman gets in the cab mm-hmm. and puts his hand on my leg no. and like and i like i was like what like i did, i was so confused so like you know i asked my relative to pull over or whatever and i told her and she was like oh yeah that happens like <laughs> you know if that happens here that's like a lawsuit it, you know you take well, also it to that court just the idea about the driving in general mm-hmm. she, she said the idea that if you don't believe in the institutions right Oh, you don't believe in the sanctity of them, or if you don't believe in the efficacy of them, you 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 don't you won't observe the laws. You don't. Mm-hmm. You, you, who cares about the laws then? And so, so hence the yeah. the chaos of the driving situation exactly. in a place like Tehran. Yeah. Um, it, the, the the returning clothing thing was so interesting. I mean, I remember reading that in her book and telling some folks about it, and and it's uh, um, and. People, I mean, you guys like shy. Do you understand what she's talking about when she talks about that? I mean, that that like the returning policy that it would be a surprise, you know, to somebody coming from. I mean, maybe not now, but certainly in the past, coming from Iran, you know, uh, it's so fascinating to me as somebody who grew up here. 
I've never I've never known a world yeah. that isn't about returning things. Yeah, that's interesting because I experienced that firsthand with my mom. Because my mom is notorious for the returning. And like everybody in our family knows that like Fariba goes shopping so that she can return the item the next day. <laughs> it's it's crazy, and every time she goes shopping, she asks the shopper like the 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 whatever the store that what their return policy is and most of the time it's like no return policy she was in heaven she couldn't believe she came here i took her shopping and then the first time she came here it was a few years ago and then uh she didn't like the item she was like ah oh, this is like i don't like the color or whatever and then my dad he was, he was like oh you're stuck with it i'm like no just let's go like you have the receipt she was like, what? I can just return it, no problem? I'm like, yeah. She's like, okay. So she was prepared. Exactly the same story. She went to the store. They took it back. She was like, this is so easy. And then my dad was like, oh, this is this is problem. On the flip side, <laughs> over there, you, you do bargaining. Like, you go to yeah. a store and bargain. Oh, yes, so that's like true. She couldn't version. do that yeah. here. And she was like, come on, ask for a discount. I'm like, yeah. you can't do that, Ma. It's, it's not, like, price. I can't ask for a yeah. discount. Yeah. This is Marshall's. Like, That's so funny. You go to a, like a gas station and uh, <laughs> it's like, tell them we'll give them $10. And it's like, no, it doesn't work like that. You gotta. You can't. <laughs> what I really appreciated the, um, she kind of embodies the, in, in, in the celebration of duality. Like yeah. I, I really appreciate that Roya is very, you know, you know, we, we we find so many people in the diaspora who are either in one camp or the other. They're either in the camp of, uh, I reject Iran, I hate what it's turned into, or, you know, I, I, don't, I wouldn't go back there, I'm a Western person now, this is where I want to be, uh, uh, or... Um, the thing of you know everything was better in Iran. Oh, my Dashti, we have this. It's much better. In, in, in and the fact that she's so bold about saying, "I love America. It gave me all these opportunities. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate being here. This is what I want to do." You know, and an appreciation for Iranian culture and yeah. her background and all that. I mean that that is the is sort of the the essence of the duality that we 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 all kind of are navigating. And mm -hmm. I thought she that she. That's such a great job of that. Yeah, I'm definitely going to pick up her books like right after. As this. you should. You guys should all pick up yeah. the books. I, uh, Shia, Keon, you guys will enjoy reading them. Reza, you can look at the covers. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, get, get somebody get to read. Get your covers. girlfriend to read them for you. I hope all there's right. lots of pictures in it. <laughs> yeah. Son of a gun. <laughs> Son of a gun. Son of a gun. Uh, a shout out to Arash and Anita Fazalipur, the founders of MyTerms.ca, a successful mortgage company in Ontario, Canada. They believe in educating their clients to understand every aspect of the financing being obtained, and they see each transaction through from beginning to end to make sure they are closed with ease. If you're looking for a mortgage in Toronto or the greater Ontario region, go to MyTerms.ca. .ca. They are among the best, and both Anita and Arash make it a priority to give back to the Persian community. Big thanks to them and MyTerms.ca, as well as Kati Kavandi and Kati Kavandi Immigration Services, uh, which you can find at Kavandi.ca. You know, due to uh, recent news in Iran regarding the potential restricting of internet use, apparently the word immigration is the most used Google search uh, word in Iran and the immigration demands have skyrocketed in recent weeks. So you want to find the right immigration consultant. You don't want a consultant who might take advantage of this huge amount of applicants for beneficial purposes by giving misleading information. If you're looking for an immigration consultant, search if they are official members of the ICCRC, look up their reviews. Kati Kavandi, Immigration Services Inc. is well known for working honestly with their clients, very responsive and uh, handling and chaperoning successful applications all the way through the process. You can check out their reviews on Google, Kati Kavandi Immigration Services, Kavandi.ca, or find them on Instagram at Kati.Kavandi.Immigration. All right, it's Monday. Let's get to Letters of the Week. Uh, yeah. 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 <laughs> what do you got for us, I really Kim? thought he wouldn't do it today. I what was almost hopeful. 
Okay, so last week on episode 142, we had Iranian-British psychologist and author Dr. Fatali Mogadam. And if you watched the Netflix series How to Become a Tyrant, you'll recognize him. Yes, and he, he's been lamenting what he sees as a global backward slide into authoritarianism in many countries. That's right. Um, one of my favorite episodes, by the way, very educational. Um, so we have username F. FZ Elegant wrote, great conversation. I really enjoyed it. Now I'm thrilled to follow his publications. Are you FZ Elegant? Uh, that is not me, no. FZ Elegant? F-Z, no, I, that is not my okay. Elias, no. Um, and alias. Then, alias. Ali, Elias? No, it's <laughs> Alias. Dear Lord. <laughs> it's Shia, also not your Elias. Shia, can you teach me English? <laughs> That'd be great. Hob, and then uh, Alfred Weber wrote saying, well, it's I okay, Keon. You recently came from Iran. <laughs> I, I was only born and raised, you know, my whole life. That's what you went to Niagara Falls. You were, you were, you were born in Qom, and you just learned English recently. Oh, God. You see, there's a fob in all of us. It's That's deeply right. embedded True. in there. Uh, Alfred Weber wrote to us saying, Well, I feel slightly less proud and slightly more embarrassed and ashamed to be human after listening to that, but I'm glad I did. The naivete of, ac- of young academics in revolutionary environments is mega cringeworthy. When the outcome is bad, I have no love for the innocence of the naive dreams that preceded it. The sober reflections now on offer from various sources, which are no consolation for the ongoing incredible suffering, are excruciating. Still, it's important to hear these snippets of post-hangover, post-dopamine crash clarity, although I doubt they will prevent a repeat of similar tragedies. Oof. So you, do you, you know what Alfred Weber is relating to there or no. referring to? No. What are you talking about? What? what? <laughs> <laughs> just, no, like, I'm talking about the letter you just oh, read. Oh, I thought you meant his name. Like no, 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 no. What, what Alfred Weber? This guy's name is Alfred Re- right. Weber, right? What do you do? You oh, get, yeah. get what he's referring of to? Of course, the revolution and the whole like hope of people causing it, and then the outcome just completely. And specifically, uh, Fatali Mukaddam was mm-hmm. one of those. He he went back yeah. in '79 yeah. with the. As he describes it, the energy, the excitement yeah. of thinking it was going to be a change that oh. would be sustained in a good way. Yeah, a lot of them did. A lot of the young academics at the time, which I mean, Alfred Weber is particularly hard on them, saying the uh, this cringeworthy and uh, that he's got no love for that. But um, but I also appreciate the poetry of the way mm-hmm. Alfred Weber wrote that. Yeah. I quite enjoyed that. Yes. And then Mary Dodd wrote to us saying, We're related to and evolved from large apes, and the dominant alpha male is the dictator. Sadly, we see the strong man myth coming back in vogue. Mm-hmm. Mm. The gulach. <laughs> There's always a gulach in the tribe. Um, and then Zoya Katuli wrote saying, Awesome interview. Very informative. I listened to it a few times. Talking about the psychology of dictatorship brought me a new perspective of dictators and how they get power by creating an environment of fear to maintain in power. Thanks, Gian and Rook team. Well done. Nice. Thank you, Zoya. And then a username by, uh, it's called Hushang Academy, said, Thank you for this conversation, Gian and company. I enjoyed it and learned immensely from it. Hushang Academy is a great uh, English teacher. Speak, uh, uh, teach, teaches English to Persians. I'll have to reach out to him. You will actually. <laughs> will need okay, some help could, over here. Very helpful. We could, if we could, if only we could have him on staff, like an au pair, <laughs> taking care of the the whole team. Pronunciations <laughs> once in yeah. a while. I don't know. Make sure you don't use on? your Elias. <laughs> uh, as well, last week on episode 143, we had Iranian Australian singer and composer Tara Tiba on the show. Yeah. One of my personal favorites. Mm-hmm. Love her music. Um, username AOK wrote saying, Her music is amazing. I don't know how she's not more famous. I agree with that, actually. I don't know why she doesn't get more attention, like more publicity, more anything. Well, one thing is she hasn't been, she's, she's not particularly prolific. Like she put out that last record in 2019. Mm-hmm. Partly because of health difficulties, etc. Yeah. She has, she's just not in your face on Instagram like true. a lot of I guess that's artists it, yeah. are, you know. So that yeah. that might be part of what's. Uh, that's true. Making it a slower climb for Taratiba. Yeah. So then we have Zhu Zhu Yan wrote to us saying, "Love the tone of her voice. I connect deeply with her music." Nice. 
Um, so on that actual episode, Tara herself brought up the, um, she talked about the stresses of preparing for the concours in Iran. So a f- few people wrote about that's that. That's just a national exam. That's right. Yeah. Uh, so we have Bobby, I'm assuming that's uh, Bobak, but you know, Bo- Bobby, uh, wrote saying, just for your information, getting a high score in some of the Azad University programs is not that difficult as Shia explained. It depends on the program. The competition is between less than a million candidates in most of the programs. Not as difficult, I guess. Here we thought high. Shia was a genius. Right. Saying he was number one. Less than a million. <laughs> That's so it's it? basically a very small pool. <laughs> <laughs> That's very impressive still. Less than a million if you're still number one. I wonder where Reza would uh, would be on that chart. Probably at the bottom of the list. <laughs> no. Oh, no. That's no. not true at Give all. Give yourself credit. You'd be the second last. <laughs> <laughs> bottom 10%, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then we have uh, Gita Williams wrote to us saying, I wish you kept the Rook theme music, which was played in August. It was more upbeat than the original. I was so happy with that one. Please consider changing it. By the way, your voice is amazing, and I never get tired of listening to you. Thank you, Gita. You know, it's funny. Somebody else said uh, when we were playing that, uh, our, our music for our packages, our, packaged our, our, uh-huh. our special shows mm-hmm. that we had there, somebody else wrote and said, what did you do with the theme? Why did you put this new thing? You know, so <laughs> this file this under. You can't please everybody yeah. or anybody, as the case may be. <laughs> That's right. uh, as well, yesterday on Instagram, we posted our latest Rook Funny, where we discussed the words doff and poff. Which apparently mean hot girl and hot guy. I mean, at least that's to our understanding. Uh, Shaheen Bahrai wrote to us saying, I never heard puff being used to describe a hot man. Shia made it up himself. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 Shia did not make that up. <laughs> no, no. I've heard duff. I just I wasn't aware yeah. of puff. But, but I didn't make it up, really. Of course not. Yeah. Yeah. He's a philosopher. He doesn't make things up. <laughs> <laughs> they come to him in vision. <laughs> Uh, Hope. And then we have Neda wrote to us saying, It's funny to see that Doff, hot girl, was actually a made up expression back in 2003 to 2004 between my guy friends. They were joking by using it with other people who had no idea what it meant. I recall I made puff for hot guys at that time when my feminist side kicked in, but I heard it got popular over the years. I'm curious if anyone was using it earlier than 2002, or if it's made its way to other so parts wait, of Iran. So wait, this person is claiming it? that they discovered. <laughs> they are. They yes. started. Not these discovered. Words. They yeah. started. Like right. they started. invented it. Wow. I mean, well, the thing Nada, is, Nada, we should. We have. We have to get Nada on the show. <laughs> <laughs> the where, where person who coined the terms "doff" and "boff." <laughs> right. Well, where does slang come from? Someone must have started it. So yes. Who knows? But Nada, Nada, Nada yeah. started it. And her friends, yeah. <laughs> According to Nada. <laughs> It's Neda, by the way. Neda. <laughs> Finally, it's time for Letter of the Week. Ooh. Ooh. Come on, guys. A little more enthusiasm. <laughs> All right, just stop. Uh, this week's Letter of the Week goes to uh, username Almond Blossom. Neda? Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> the, there was no name listed. It was just oh, okay. Almond Blossom. Okay. Wrote to us saying, this episode was amazing. I really liked it. Patty says Uncle's idea of Shia was so funny, oh but I don't agree with him. Okay, so that we you got a recap. What's oh. the, you know, tell us about that. Okay, so uh, Patty says Uncle told uh, told her that he doesn't like Shia. Yeah. He, the like, only person we've ever found. Him. Him. The only person that, other than Shia's family <laughs> yeah. that doesn't like him. <laughs> yeah, it was quite shocking. Actually. And we were like, what? What do you mean How you don't like you? Yeah, yeah. yeah, It's like hating a puppy, as Reza said. <laughs> Uh, yes, so she goes on saying, but I don't agree with him and think Shia is a gentle and lovely boy. Oh. Good luck, Rook team. That's See, a that was short. That's the week. That's yeah, a letter that's a letter. 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 Short In sweet. honor of Shia. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we love you, Shia. Oh, okay, that was I weird. love you too. Wow. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Well, that was great. Thank you very much, Keon. <laughs> <laughs> if you need That's me to make things awkward, I'm, I'm great here. Great letter of the week. Uh, thank you, uh, Captain Reza, Groovy Shia, the fabulous Keon. Uh, you're all the best. This is full time for Rook for today. See you all on Thursday with our Rook Roundtable. And I think Hamid Saidi is joining us on Thursday. This is Full Time for Rook for today. Our website for all things Rook, our previous episodes, our guests, our Rook funnies, our videos, rookmedia.com, R-O-Q-E, media.com. Thanks to the amazing team who put this show together. Ponta, the artist, Thoughtful Nagin, the fabulous Keon, producer Susan, Super Patty Saw, Savvy Roham, Aray Merdad, 
sponsorship Sean Captain Reza and Groovy Shia thank you to all of you out there supporting us and sharing our content please subscribe on any or all of our platforms if you've not done so already that is free you can find me on Instagram and Facebook at Gian Gomeshi in the meantime Mizunbashi Bashi